So, so welcome to this Groovy Goodness session. It's here, so it's... Does it work? I don't, I don't have, have any slides, it's just mostly live coding for me on stage, and you guys have to help me if there's something wrong, so pay attention, please. So, just a little introduction of who I am. Uh, I've been a Java developer, started in 1996 with Java applets and then continued on. I live in the Netherlands, a town called Tilburg, in the southern parts of the Netherlands, that is. And I work at a company called JDriven, and in my daytime job I'm now in the Rails project, so that's cool. Um, I started using Groovy and experimenting with it in 2008, and Rails since 2009. And while experimenting with it, I wrote down little code snippets in a blog called Gro Groovy Goodness. And I think it's now contains for the Groovy part of more than 250 items, so... On this session, I will uh, cherry pick from those and even do some new things yeah, we learned at the conference. You can follow me on Twitter, at Mr. Haki. And last year, I also wrote a book on Gradle called Gradle Effective Implementation Guide. It's published by Pact Publishing. So just a little agenda to give some guidance to what we can expect during this session. Um, first, I want to focus on some syntax things in Groovy. Uh, things to make life easier. Um, so programming is much more effective for us as well. And we're going to take a closures. We're going to take a look at closures. How to use the, some of the uh, more advanced features or features you don't know yet. Hopefully, um, we take a look at some of the methods added to the collections API by Groovy. As uh, strings, a part part in everyday programming, and some miscellaneous stuff as well. So that will end my slides. Let's go over to my little IDE, which is Groovy Console. This will be, is it readable for everybody? The font also in the back, okay. Um, I wanted to start with something uh, FanCup did yesterday at Functional Groovy. Did anybody attend that session? Okay. okay. So we end with a little sample, it's a bit like this, where we can um, invoke a mailer and invoke a send method. We give the set method closure and it's used to configure a mail component basically. And that will give us a nice syntax for example to say, I want to send something to greatconf and it's for me, so I can run this code. And you can see that to and from are invoked down here, that's the output of my console, which are these two methods at the top, the to method and the from method, which just do a print line in this case. It just shows that those methods are called by this syntax. So this works fine, but still I'm allowed to abuse it. So I could say I also want to do a subject. And when I run this code at the runtime, I will get an exception that there's a missing method exception. That's true. Because I'm invoking a subject method and it should be in my mailer class, but it's not. So that's fine, it's a runtime, but it would also be nice to have it at compile time. And since this is Groovy 2, we should be able to do it. So this gave me an idea to experiment something with also as mentioned in previous sessions, and that's the new closure or new annotation delegates to. And here we can specify which class will, uh, will be used for this uh, implementation, basically. Oh, wrong key. This helps the static type checker in Groovy to determine if methods are available for this class and it will uh, not compile them. And so we also have to apply compile static. I'll compile it here and here. So now when we run this code, oops, imports. Do the imports. What am I doing wrong now? Mm. What is wrong? Let's restart my Google console. So 
somebody know what can be wrong? <laughs> Subject method, which is not there. And now, I before the, uh, the case is run, so before my code is run, it's already detected by the compiler that it's, it's not correct to use a subject method if it's not defined. It's good to have experienced people here in the room. <laughs> that can help. You have a question? Yeah. Not, not the compile static, static or... Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I think this, the, the code needs, the static link checker needs to know how to determine which class will be responsible for essentially invoking this configuration, this closure configuration. Otherwise you wouldn't know. So I can, I can fix this. To make it work again. So I could say there we go. And now it works. So it's very useful in group two to have this uh, addition that before you run the code you already get uh, the errors, which you normally wouldn't get. And we if you use dynamic typing. So let's go over to IntelliJ, see if maybe this also helps IntelliJ to do some code completion on our code. And this has should work. Let's try it. This is called the LX2 example. It's invoking send because I have done any two statements here, so there well, I just went too quickly. Let's see. So, IntelliJ, the one of the latest versions at least, supports the delegates to annotation in your code. So, now I get code completion here in the set method. So, uh, IntelliJ knows that there's a mailer uh, class available with methods that are used to implement this, uh, co this uh, closure, basically. So, now we get code completion. That's pretty cool. Let's see if it also, yeah, also the from method is uh, seen. And let's see this case. You can see uh, I only have two and from, so the subject is not here. So let's do subject. And it already, you can see it's red, which means it will not compile. It's IntelliJ already recognized this, that it will not compile. So you get immediate feedback in your, inter in your IDE, at least in this IDE. I don't know if. Eclipse or will support this or does support it? Does anybody know? Can we use it? Nobody uses Eclipse, can also be the case. <laughs> yeah. It works in Eclipse, okay. But I think this is very useful in everyday life. If you would do write code like this, then it's always good to have code completion and to have warnings before uh, the code is run, so be in compilation step that things are wrong. So that's a great addition, something I learned at this conference and I want to share with you. <laughs> it works. So let's get back to the Groove Console. Remove all the code here. Also one of the newest annotations in Groovy is the annotation collector. And with this annotation collector we can group annotations together into a new annotation. That's basically the thing you can do with it. So let's say I want to group a two-string annotation takes an argument, in this case it's include names, then 
also do the equals and hash code. Make sure I can iOS the import. There we go. I can use annotation collector here and define it. For example, I can give the name, uh, sorry, uh, simple, simple objects. There you go. So now I can write a uh, new class and apply this newly created annotation basically. So I will call create new class event, which has a name. And this event class will have both annotations I have defined here. So both to string equals hash code should be applied to this event class. So when I create a new instance, we say new event name. Of course, it's gray conf, and I can do a print line and run this code. You can see here in the output, the output of our to string annotation basically. And because I've used include names is true, it also will display the name here. If I have multiple annotations uh, grouped together by this annotation collector and the arguments of those annotations are unique within this group, I can even overwrite it here. So I could say include names is false for this case. And when I run the code again, you can see that now it's displaying without the name in the output into string. So we are very flexible to combine annotations and even to change parameter values for those annotations. You can even go a bit further, and that's something I want to show as well. Um, There it is. There it is. I will just show it here as code. I can paste it like this in my console. Makes it easier. So you can customize this as well. And then you have to write uh, an annotation collector trans at least you have to write a, a processor to process your annotations. And the simplest way to do this is to extend annotation collector transform class. And then you have to implement the visit method, which takes four arguments, basically annotation nodes that are applied, and there's a source unit. So there's a bit of AST transformation here as well. So if you know AST transformation, this will be not that hard. So what I want to accomplish basically is um, I have here in my code the annotation collector using a different syntax this time. I can before we saw, I uh, first defined my annotations, and when the last annotation was the annotation collector, it will group the, uh, the ones that are above it. I can also use value and then uh, uh, use a, a list with the annotations here. And I can define my own processor, so my code that will handle this annotation. And I want to be able to use a new parameter for my annotation, don't use, in this case, don't use name. <coughs> Well, the, the example is not that difficult. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm getting from my new simple object uh, annotation all the members. So that's basically all the uh, arguments that are given for this annotation. One of them should be the don't use argument. So I will get it here. Remove it from the list. And if it's available, I want to turn it into an excludes argument. And excludes is available both by the toString and equals and hash code as well. And then I just invoke the super method uh, here. So by writing this code, I now have introduced my own argument for this annotation that I've just created using the annotation collector. And it just, when I run it, you can see, <coughs> Don't use name means I want to exclude my name property from the output. And if you look at the output, it's also not there. So that works. So we are very flexible with this way of working with annotations. And I think we'll even clean up your code because using syntax like this makes a lot more sense than just reapplying multiple annotations that will do the same thing. So that's also quite nice. One of the other things that was added to Groovy 2.1, 2 I think, was the uh, literals with underscores. It's 
it's also quite fun. Uh, so, for example, I can have a number correspond to yeah, like this. <coughs> and this is just a valid number I can display. Um, let's do some other groovy magic using static imports. I can say, for example, using the S keyword for an import static, just reassigning it to my own name. And I can do just from the ones you can also do in Java as well. So this should be enable me to do formatter. Uh, sorry. So very clean syntax using Groovy, mag well, not magic, but Groovy additions, and here in the output you can see it's just really displayed as a number again, using the format we have supplied here. Another thing we can do in Groovy is multiple assignments. I don't know if anybody has used it before, but for example, I can say I have um, a list. And I can assign the values from this list immediately to different uh, variables. So I could say print line A and print line B. That works. So by just using this multiple assignment um, syntax, the values in my list are immediately assigned to those two variables here. And I can even use types if I want to. And then it still works. But you can also use this multiple assignment thing um, as a return result for constructors, that's a funny thing to do. So <laughs> let's say I have a um, class point which has basically two properties, x and y. And now if I implement a get add method, which takes an index, I can say if, um, well, index is zero, return x, otherwise return y. close my class here. I can create a new instance and then immediately assign the result for my constructor to different variables. So let's do C and D. C U point. There I can print C, I can print line B. Remove it. Yep, so <laughs> now I'm getting deep. I think it's pretty fancy to create a constructor and just get multiple assignments <laughs> back and then can assign it to, uh, to variables. So that's also possible in Ruby. And it's just by implementing get that method in your class, basically. If people have questions, just ask them. Then maybe I, I can ask them, but other people can maybe as well answer them. So another th uh, thing you can do in Groovy is uh, using uh, standard keywords as method names, and that can be quite funny to do. So for example, I have a class user, and I want to have a method called return. And normally in Java you cannot create a method named return because return is a reserved keyword. Well, in Groovy if you do it like this, you can. So let's return a string. Close it so I create a new instance of my new um, of my user object and then I can say return and it will print out my return. So you have even more choice to name your methods in Groovy than in Java. You can also use, for example, switch. So let's do also reverse. So there you go. Let's also reverse. I always like Groovy and having fun with playing around with things like this. <laughs> like this. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? One of the other things in Groovy supports is a uh, default type conversion, which means the return type of your methods. Um, basically, if you use strings, booleans, or class as a return type, Groovy will automatically convert your last statement to the type you specified. So you don't have to do the type conversion yourself. So let's reuse it, this method. So instead of returning a string, I'm returning now 
I think it's an integer, but my return type of the method is of type string, so let's see what Groovy does. It returns 42, but what is my class name? It's a string. So it's done automatically for us. We don't have to do it ourselves. Maybe we can do boolean. It's a boolean, but what is that string for also the value? So there is a switch. Print line, thank you. Which is true. Bit of groovy truth. Um, if we use zero, that will be false. So that's one of the things in Groovy. Um, multiple things can be true or false in Groovy. If you have an empty list, it will be false. Or you have a string that has uh, is empty or null, it will be false. And also for numbers, the, zero, the number zero means um, means false. Any other, other number it means it's true. That is also works for class. It's just one last one thing I want to show. So we could say Java Util list. So I have an the last table of a method is of type string, but because I've used the class type here as the uh, return type of this method, it will automatically be converted to the correct type. So this also uh, makes your code much more clean, but also something to remember when you write code, because it also can be source of bugs, if you don't know that this kind of thing happens. <laughs> and people will, will just chase down maybe the wrong road. So another thing that's big in, in Groovy is closures. Um, closures are basically used all around in Groovy code, in the, in the GTK for Groovy, for example, as well. And in Groovy, to create a closure, that's not that difficult. So let's say I create a closure that's called upper, which will invoke the uppercase method on what I put in there. Let's also create a convert, convert closure and just use some of Groovy's added expandable class. It's just basically a class that is dynamically uh, capable of adding properties and methods. So in this case, this will be a new class which has a language property and the value should be the value uh, used in the, in the closure. So I can combine those together and make one new closure using closure composition. Um, so I could say first do upper and then do convert. And now I should have a new closure to all together. Let's see if it's to compose closure, so that means I should be able to use it as well in my code. So I have here, um, let's take a list and the alpha, and then we can say collect because that's what we're supposed to do. And I can use it together, right? Like this. There's a lot of spaces. <coughs> Just do it on the safe side. Does this work? No. I have my mistype in that can also be the case. Let's create a new list. No, this works. I think it has to do with parentheses and print lines, and sometimes things get mixed up, but this works. So basically, what happens, I have my list here with two items, uh, both type string. Um, using the collect method, so the collect method uh, will go through my uh, through my list and apply the closure I've uh, defined here. And the closure is a composed closure of other closures, and that's a nice way to chain up closures and to write code that's really clear and simple to read. You can also use the other way around, and then I should do it like this because. So I can use both le left shift operators and right shift operators, and the result is still the same. So another thing we can do is quite funny. We can create methods or closures that return closures themselves. Uh, because if you think about it, a closure is just a code block, which can be assigned to a variable. But it can also be, of course, the return statement of a method. I mean, why not? So let's create a method, and the method will take one argument, 
and we use that argument to create a new closure. So, for example, I can say, <coughs> say the times. So you notice this method, uh, the last statement of a method, we don't need return statements in, in Groove, we just return now a new closure, and the closure should be invoked. And uh, let's say I want to do uh, a print line of this method. So I want to print out the method and specify it two times. So this should in if you this method returns closure, so I could call this closure using value, like this. This should work, right? Yeah, it does. Um, we don't have to use call. We can even make it more funky, do it like this. And it also works. So it's, if you read the syntax the first time around, you maybe think, well, this could not happen, but it really happens. And if you go down the road, you can see that, well, closures can also be returned out. So method, why not? It's possible. You can even, do something more, so let's say we specify an extra, uh, extra argument for this method and give it a default value because that's also possible in Groovy and not in Java, but it makes still works. And let's do another one, and this time I will um, do an upcase closure. So <coughs> the transformer argument of my method will now be. Uh, the new closure where I do an uppercase on the value and then I do an invocation again of the closure that's returned. Uh, then I should not only give this method this, I should also invoke it, right? So now I'm passing on a new closure transformer, I will invoke the closure on the value that's from the previous closure and well, it works now. You can see here it's first upcase and then times two. It looks funky and groovy and that's, well, it's groovy, so why not? And it's possible. Um, also, because closures are not, it just code blocks with, uh, that can be passed around, you can also immediately invoke closures and get the result back. Just a little sample. First, let's create a closure which returns just a string, for example. And I have to do print line s to show it. Well, we can also do it here, for example, and then we get the same result. So just by adding those parentheses at the end of the closure, then the closure will be invoked immediately. And the last statement is assigned to a variable. So now s is not anymore a closure, but it's the result of my closure invocation. So another big thing in when you do everyday program is working with strings. And Groovy has a uh, very nice addition to it. It's called the D-string, where you can add expressions to double-quoted strings, and those will be evaluated uh, by Groovy. But you can also inspect what's inside uh, a D-string implementation. We have different methods and uh, ways to get to those. So let's say I'm creating a new D-string implementation that will be an event. So in great conf and also do my date. I can do print line and that's what we expect. That's the event is um, added to my uh, string and there's a new date. But I can also ask different things now about my string because if I look closely, it's not really a string class, it's a G-string implementation. And I can ask certain things about it. Uh, for example, I can do value count is two. So this means in my D-string implementation, I have two expressions. That's what by this method, what this uh, property returns. I can also do values. So now I get back the actual values of my D-string after it's been uh, implemented. So I have two values here, great count 2013 and the current date. That's also possible. I can also do indexed get values. So I can do get value and then Using the index uh, 1, I will get back the date 1. If I do index 0, I will get back the string value of great count 2013. And if I do really want to split it up, so I want to get back all the string parts around all the expressions, I can do strings. And then we get a new list with, in this case, three items. First item is welcome to with space. 
then there's a space followed by online space, and then finally there's an empty. So besides um, evoking this GCM implementation, we can also use it to get data from the GCM implementation, what's in there, and maybe want to manipulate it. it we can do it if we want to. So in Groovy, we have multiple ways to do things, um, just to make life easier. So for example, if I have a string and the string value is y, I should be able to do something like true boolean. It should be true. Yeah, it is. So I say no, it's false. If I say zero, it's false. If I say one, it's true. And if I say true, it's true. If I say false, it's false. So as a two boolean method in string, uh, we'll recognize the value if it's uh, true, um, one or uh, not zero or um, y. It will turn true. Otherwise, it's false. So we have different ways to define string values that need to be turned into booleans. <coughs> Another thing you can do in Groovy is uh, translate data. So just a very simple example. Let's say there's a sand string. Let's call it with read content. And there's a method called tr for translate. And let's do print line. Which takes two arguments. Basically, the first argument is uh, the characters I want to translate, and the second argument is the replacement character. So, um, why not change G to G and F to 7 and Y to Y and then run it? And I've scrambled my string. So, you can see the single characters in the string are all replaced by the counterparts in the second argument of the TR method. So a very simple way to translate strings, basically. And also something I found out just recently, there's also an on the string. The string has a lot of extra methods added by Groovy. And one of them is collect, uh, let's see, collect replacements. Which takes a closure. In the closure, each character is um, the closure is invoked for each character, and we can do conditional statements here, for example. So if I say that my character is uh, G, I want, I want to turn it to capital G, and otherwise turn everything else to A. Replacement. There you go. So this is one way of turning it to a different string. If we this uh, closure returns null. No, it will not be replaced, so then we back to the normal string again. It's one of the fun things to really work with Groove. Just take 10, 15 minutes a day to look at the uh, GVK documentation, the API, and just every time when I look at it, there's something new. I don't know why, but. <laughs> mm. So if you work with collections in Groove, you already know it's quite difficult. Easy to create a collection compared to if you do it in Java. So, so here I have my collection. And to get elements from the collection, I have different ways to do it. Uh, I can basically use get add. This is using the square brackets, which is my first element. So to get the last element, I can use this syntax. So here you can see the result. I can move it a bit up so it's closer. I shouldn't have done that. Ah, it's still on there. Another way to do it is there are methods also available to get it, so just to make it more clear what we're doing. So get the first element, why not? So there should probably be a last method. Yeah, that works. We can also use head and tail for lists, so we can do head and tail. So with the head method, it will turn the first item of this list. With the tail method, I will get the rest of the list. Also, a nice one is the take method. So, let's say I want to take the first two elements. So, invoke the take method and you can also do drop. So, with the take uh, method, it will take the first two items of my list. And if I do more, then it will just return what's there. It will not fail. 
And by drop, it will first drop the number of elements I've specified as an argument for my drop method, and then I will get back result four and five here. And if it would not be groovy, if we also have uh, some way to specify closure here. So for example, I could say, while well it's smaller than three, take it, and this also works for drop, so there's also a drop while. Now I've printed out. So, so besides the take and drop method, we also have take while and drop while method, which takes closures and then just specify the condition you want to be applied before the items are dropped or taken from the list. Another thing we can do in Groovy is um, creating sub lists from one big list. And then we have to use the collate method, it's just added for us, so we can do print line collate. And Let's group it by two. So now I have a new list, which contains basically three items. Um, the first item is the new list, one and two it contains, and then there's a, three, a list containing three and four, and finally there's five in the list. So a very simple way to split up strings and uh, split up a list, sorry, and have sub list available. And also if you want to generate more data from your list, there are also nice methods available. So, for example, I can do permutations and subsequences, and then I get a lot of numbers. Let's, ah, there it is. Let's do the first one, and make the list a bit shorter to show what happens. There you go. So with subsequences, it will generate a new list, and all items in the list are well, basically subsequences from my original list. So I have now all different kinds of lists from my original list, and if I do the permutations, you can see it will uh, do reordering of items in my original list and then return it as another big list. This also may, might be useful in, for example, if using Groovy in test cases and stuff like that. If you want to generate a lot of data and want to go. So we all probably know the defined all method. So the defined all method is just for filtering basically what's in a list. So I could say, let's do the same sample as Fencat was using at Functional Groovy. Let's add it here. So this returns the items that are uh, applied to this condition. But what about if we do use the find all method without any arguments? which is also possible. Then Groovy will try to evaluate each item and try to uh, apply Groovy truth to it, basically. So I can do multiple items here. Two of those here. So by now using find all without any arguments, it should fill out my false, my empty list, my empty string, my null. And it does. So just a very easy way to just fill out anything that's no, or it's these false groovy uh, terms. Just don't apply any arguments for it, for the find all method. Another thing I want to show is, uh, if you go back to a command line, groovy is able, if you do it from a command line, to run remote scripts as well. So if I have a script somewhere on the internet, I should be able to run it. Um, URL I get from somewhere else. There it is. So here you can see the script, basically. It's on a remote server. It's just doing some print lines using each, and there's a method call in there. And I should be able to invoke this from the command line. Let's paste it in. There you go. And of course, Groovy works. We all know it. That's also very powerful to work uh, to work with scripts in Groovy. Um, another thing, if you work with uh, XML in Groovy, uh, it's quite easy to parse XML and create XML. That's not that difficult. So first, I will uh, get some XML example. So I will get a string, and it's long string. It's no has no formatting. So what if you want to format the string? There is an XML util class which contains serialized methods. And I can give it my string, and I have to make sure I can first import groovy.xml. So 
now I have my string that was ha didn't have any formatting by just applying serialized method on the XML util class. It's now formatted, so that's very easy to do. The serialized method is overloaded for, uh, for strings. It also can uh, be used for nodes, which are returned by XML parser, or by GPath results, which are returned by XML parser. So let's just do a quick check here. It should be XML parser, parse, text, something like this. Okay. So I should be able to use the node. That works. Then there's also, of course, the I always like name server. So parse text and the XML string. Moving down. In this case, using GPath. And it still works. So if you want to print out XML uh, that's first given to you in a string format of or it's the result of the parsing of it, uh, using XML parse XML server, you can still use the same class and the same method for it and it will display nicely. Uh, there's also another uh, thing, uh, other class we can use for it, and it's called XML Node Printer. Let's, just, let's give it a name, let's view. Which gives us some more uh, configuration on how we want to output XML. And basically this takes a new writer object, and then I will just do it like this. I have to create, of course, my so I, I, I use, use a string right here, so I can, can just do two string at the end of this to display the output. Um, node printer, and I should be able to print my node. Okay. The thing is, it only works on the output of the XML parser. Uh, XML parser, yeah, parse text ma method. So remove it. Test sheet. And then, of course, print the output. So now, by using the XML node printer, I also have reformatted my original string. So mm, this has some default indentation. Maybe I want to change it. I can change the indentation using the constructor. So let's use two tabs. When we run the code again, you can see it's using other tabs as an indentation. But it's also possible to do something with white space. So I could do node printer width, and then say preserve. White space is true. I can also say that I want to use different quotes. It's now using double quotes from attributes, as you can see here. So I have an ID attribute and it uses double quotes to display it. I want to turn to single quotes. I just have to reconfigure it. And now when I run it again, you can see it's using single quotes. Preserve white space is still the same. I'll expect a different result. Did I make a typo? Ah, okay, so it's a small capital, uh, small s. So, so preserve white space too, it will uh, have a different output than what we saw earlier. Another nice thing that's uh, added lately to one of the Groovy uh, releases, we can just invoke a directory size method on a file, uh, or a directory basically. So let's say I have a directory shouldn't be too big, because otherwise it takes long. Um, let's do projects with... What's the wrong name? There you go. I could be able to say directory size. File not found. So, let's copy it. Returning. So, my directory size, this is in, I think, kilobytes. So, also one of the things that Groovy adds to standard Java objects, or Java classes, and we can use it here. Uh, also, uh, we noticed, uh, we already probably know that to get, um, uh, to get an URL object, we can get a string and invoke the to URL method on it, and we get the URL object, so that works. And also we can do 
get text basically, and then it will get the text from that URL. So that's also an XML file in this case. But we also can add some configuration parami par parameters to it. So I can say get text. Um, then can say uh, timeout for example. Um, we still get the result, but, uh, but if the timeout uh, limit was uh, reached, then it would have stopped before. So I can configure the get text uh, method basically. Something is also added in one of the latest uh, releases of Groovy. So, as a final thing, uh, I'm working on Groovy Console, and one of the nice things Groovy Console is you can even tweak the output. You can see now that in the output we have all the, well, basically we see string values, but we can change it. If you go to your user home directory, there should be a Groovy directory, and if we put in that directory a file called output transforms.groovy, it will be picked up by the Groovy console. And here we can do things like, is this readable? Maybe not. Um, like this. We, can, we have in this uh, in the script, we have a transforms, basically a transforms list where we can add new closures to. And we can do conditional statements here and uh, tweak with the output. So what I've done here, if the last statement in my Groove Console is a type string, um, then I get into the zip block. And then I do another check. If the result contains HTML before and after the string value, then I'm creating a new JLabel, and that's a string component, and Groove Console is also a string component, so we'll be able to display it. If the uh, result uh, string contains grade comp logo, it will display an image. In this case, it will be logo, and otherwise, just return the result. So let's see if this works. So I have a new string, so let's call it HTML. I can use bold, should be able to use it. So let's run. Yeah. So this is now my last statement in the Groove Console, and here the JLabel is applied. And if I type click on logo and use the correct syntax, oh, this was not a big moment. Uh, oh, I will use the correct string. Oh, there you go. And now I have a logo. So, my time is almost up. Are there any questions? Did people hear something they didn't know yet? Ah, yeah. Thank you for listening. Enjoy the rest of the conference. I will be in the room across now. So <laughs> maybe we'll see some of you there. And thank you for listening. Right. It's time for.